So why are we doing this? What are some of the advantages? I, I'm going to spend very little time on this because I think we've gotten to a point where most of you probably have already uh, sort of understood on your own the reasons for PCI compliance. It's almost less these days a matter of what are the advantages and more a matter of we just have to do it. It's, it's gotten to that point, and you'll see that reflected in the media and articles that are coming out left and right about breaches and enforcement and penalties. And uh, there are examples after examples, but the bottom line is that enforcement uh, as it relates to PCI is happening more strictly and, and aggressively than we're seeing in any other compliance framework out there, hands down. So it's more a matter of just a reality of doing business today with electronic payments, but I have listed out some of the other advantages here. There's certainly some organizational benefits. I think most of you can guess what they'd be, a lot of risk reduction, some organizational uh, efficiencies that you gain by improving centralization of controls, et cetera. But overall, it's really about risk reduction and getting the safe harbor protection that, that PCI offers. I'm going to come back and touch on that safe harbor protection later because that's one of the things that's now evolving, uh, which we'll cover in Section 3. Now that we're seeing some state laws tied into PCI, some of those are actually bringing some reinforcement to the safe harbor concept. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So what's the impact of non-compliance? Again, I think most of you uh, already have some sense of this. Certainly you all understand that uh, not being compliant and having some kind of a breach event would not be a good thing. If you are not compliant and you have some kind of a compromise, here's sort of some of the things that are going to happen. You're going to have all sorts of obvious brand and reputational damage because you're going to have to notify. Uh, that's some, somewhat of that is coming from PCI. Some of that is coming from all of the state breach notification laws which, again, we'll talk about a little bit later. There's forensic investigations that will be mandated by the card brands. These are not cheap. They take a lot of time, and those firms are expensive in what they do. Then there's, of course, all the remediation costs in order to achieve and demonstrate full compliance as a level one merchant, which would be the automatic result of a, of a breach, regardless of what your level was previously. We will talk about levels in a short while. There's all sorts of fines and penalties, some of those coming from the card brands themselves, others coming from other areas such as you know, potential lawsuits and uh, uh, legal uh, implications that we'll cover a little bit more later. Each brand, each card brand, uh, has their own fines and penalty structures. We'll talk about some of those on the next slide, but I don't want to focus too much on this because really that shouldn't be the main driver here. The, uh, the impact in terms of your brand damage and recovering from a breach um, are going to be far heavier in other areas than the, the fines coming straight from the card brand. You'll find, in most cases, those are the least of your worries, unfortunately. Card reissuance costs. Most of the banks are going to hold you accountable for the cost of reissuing compromised cards, typically rated at $25 to $50 per card. So those start to mount up very quickly. Victim notification costs, financial losses associated with any of the compromised cards, various other sorts of data loss impacts if there was other uh, sensitive data exposed, chargebacks for any of the fraudulent transactions, which are often levied uh, by the banks, uh, business disruption often as a result of the forensic investigations and the recovery efforts. You might have to, we've had clients that have had to completely shut down credit card acceptance for uh, extended periods of time while they were in remediation. Individual executives could potentially be held liable due to some of the uh, evolving uh, legislative uh, requirements. Now this is uh, not a very common uh, concern as it comes to PCI compliance, but it's certainly something that we're seeing a lot more coming out of areas like the FTC and uh, areas dealing with overall privacy, which certainly tie in with some of the cardholder data protection initiatives. Possibility of business closure. This can be a terminal event for some businesses because what typically happens when, an, when a breach occurs is the card brands are very good at identifying that. So even though you're supposed to notify them in near real time of a breach, even if you don't, they're going to find out because people are going to start to report their credit cards as compromised, and the card brands are very good at correlating all of these various credit cards and correlating them back to a common point of purchase, which will lead them back to your business. They will tell you that you've been compromised and require an, an investigation. And uh, during that time, what often happens, unfortunately, is that the card brands through the acquiring banks will put a freeze on settlement funds. It's not innocent until proven guilty here. It's, it's the reverse. They will freeze your funds. Uh, we have clients who have had well over a million dollars in their settlement accounts frozen pending the outcome of the investigation just to determine what the scope of, of the breach was or if there even was a legitimate breach. So for some businesses, unfortunately, that can be uh, difficult, if not impossible, to make it through um, if, that, if that's extended. 
So this is no small thing. Uh, some of the breach finds, and I'm not going to spend much time here. Again, so this shouldn't be the focus, but Visa has published these finds, basically getting quickly into the tens of thousands and then up into the hundreds of thousands for the larger merchants. Breach-related fines, additional fines tied to having a breach and not reporting that appropriately or having stored track data, which you're not supposed to have. So they have some additional fines tied to that. MasterCard has their own series of fines published. And again, all the card brands have the ability to do fining. These are the only two that have really published anything. The card brands are really kind of holding this, this information close. They really almost don't want to publish what they're doing on fines and penalties. You know, they have some flexibility then in how they deal with each given situation. But these have been published, so this is the best general guidance we can give you. It's always going to be based on the specific scenario. It's going to be based on what sort of due diligence you can show. And that's why it should all be about really, are we meeting the intent of these requirements? So here's an important slide. Let's put this into context. You've got three different standards that actually make up PCI compliance. Now, some of you might not have known that. You've all certainly heard of the DSS over here on the right side. That is the data security standard. That applies to organizations that handle credit card data, like probably all of you on this call. But there's also the PADSS. That is the Payment Application Data Security Standard. And that applies to actual payment applications. So if you are a vendor that makes a payment application that you then sell to other third parties or offer to other third parties, you can have that application certified as PADSS compliant. If you do your own custom internal payment application that's just for your own company, PADSS does not apply. That's covered under the DSS. And then you have the PTS standard, which is the PIN transaction security standard. For any of you who have card present transactions, that is you're, you're doing card swipes, and you take PIN or debit transactions, only in that case you need to be using PTS compliant devices. If you don't take uh, card swipes, card present transactions, or if you don't accept PIN or debit, then PTS is not something you have to worry about. So those are the three standards that make up the PCI compliance ecosystem. And uh, you should be aware of all of these and how they relate to you, if at all. Most of you will be focused primarily on the DSS, and that is our focus for the remainder of today. So who are the players? Just so that you'll be familiar with some of the terminology you'll be hearing here, Issuers are the folks that issue credit cards. That would typically be the banks, but not always. Any financial institution can be an issuer. Sometimes credit unions get into this game and others like that. They issue those credit cards to whom? To the consumers, people like you and I. We are the consumers who go out and use our credit card at the merchants. And a merchant would be likely most of the companies on this call. Any company that accepts credit cards as payment for goods or services is a merchant. Merchants might have relationships with service providers. And this is an important concept, because service providers are often used. That's a general concept uh, in IT and elsewhere, but it means something very specific in PCI. A PCI service provider is uh, worth defining here. There's three main things that make somebody a service provider. Number one, if you provide services to a merchant that would in any way result in you getting some of their car data. That is, so in other words, if some of you have maybe a processor that you, that you work with, so you work with, uh, I don't know, Skipjack or Chase Payment Tech or any one of the other hundreds out there, and you're actually sending card data to them, and then they are processing and, and you know, forwarding information along with other banks and such as needed, they are acting as a service provider. They are a middleman. They are being given the card data that has been entrusted to you by the consumers. So the consumers are trusting you to protect that data. So the moment you turn and hand it off to a third party, you need to know that they're going to protect it too. The way PCI deals with that is through this concept of service providers. So the first category, anyone you're sharing card data with. Second category, anyone who has access to your card data. This might be certain types of managed service providers, uh, certain types of uh, consulting firms that might help support your systems, things like that. People who have access to administer your systems in a way that if they do something wrong, they could inadvertently expose or you know, give access to credit card data they would also be a service provider. And third would be anyone else who directly or indirectly could impact the security of your card data. Common example again would be managed service providers. If you have somebody that manages your firewalls or manages maybe a threat management system for you, they might not have any access to card data, but if they do something wrong, if they put a bad rule on that firewall that inadvertently opens up access, they could lead to somebody getting access to your card data. And therefore, those organizations are also classified as service providers. 
So those are service providers. Then you have acquirers. Acquirers are also known as the merchant banks, synonymous. Whatever bank issued your merchant ID, that is your acquirer. And that is a very important role in PCI because they are the ones that have the main authority over your organization in terms of enforcing PCI. We'll talk about that more on the next slide. Last but not least, we have the card brands. They're the ones driving all of this. Speaking of that, let me move on to the next slide, which deals with enforcement. So it's important to understand how this all works. What is driving PCI? Why is this, how, how is this being driven, and uh, how are penalties being applied, and what makes this all go? So at the, at the beginning, at the source, you have the card brands. They're really the ones that drive the whole thing. And there's some confusion about that. Some people think the PCI Security Standards Council is the driver. They are not. The council is just an independent body that develops the standard itself and certifies folks like us, the QSAs and the PS, PA QSAs. They are not doing anything in the way of enforcement. That is handled by the card brands. So the card brands maintain relationships with acquirers. If you're a bank and you want to offer Visa cards or MasterCards, you have to sign up with the card brands or the other card brands. And in order to sign up with them, they require you to adhere to PCI compliance and they require you to ensure all of your merchant clients are PCI compliant. So the card brands are driving compliance through the acquirers, holding them accountable. So the card brands have contracts with the banks. The banks, in turn, set up contracts with you, the merchants. So if you have any of your finance people uh, there today, they would probably be able to tell you that when they went to sign up a merchant account, they probably had to sign some legal agreement. And if you pull that out, you will probably find, whether or not you noticed it at the time of signing, there's some language in there around PCI compliance specifically, or at the very least, your need to protect cardholder data in various ways. That is how this is being enforced. It is through that contract, uh, as well as some state laws that we'll talk about later. But mainly, this is all contract-driven still. Merchants, then, are driving compliance with the service provider. So here's where it gets a little interesting, a little confusing sometimes, so bear with me. Merchants, when you go and you set up a service uh, or a partner relationship with a service provider, maybe this is a managed hosting provider that helps to support your systems. Maybe it's a processor. Maybe it's a tokenization vendor, which we'll talk about later. Could be all sorts of things. As soon as you engage with them, you're going to re be required to have a contractual agreement with them, which, among other things, holds them accountable to protecting that card data once it's in their possession, according to the, the PCI DSS. That contract is what forms your ability to hold them accountable. And yes, folks, this is how it works. You are the one that's going to have to go after that service provider if there's a breach. So let me give you an example. If there's a breach that your service provider turns out to be responsible for, say your hosting provider got compromised because of something they did wrong, there's a very good chance that that breach is going to lead back to you because it's your merchant account, and you're going to have the investigation but that investigation will lead to the service provider. You will then have to hold them accountable, uh, hopefully just via the contract. Uh, if not, then through legal action. And that is the way this works. Now, there is a dotted line, so to speak, between the acquirers and the service providers. Not to make things more complicated, but that's because at a level one, which is the, uh, the bigger volume service providers, they have to be sponsored by an acquiring bank. So the banks do get involved at some level in monitoring their compliance. But ultimately, it is really the merchants that are, that are uh, responsible for holding them accountable uh, in the case of a breach. So that's the way the accountability chain flows in PCI.